In this video, we're breaking down exactly what dog anxiety is. I'm going to examine what signs to look for in your dog that indicate your dog might have anxiety. Then we're going to segue into a full tutorial on how to treat your dog's anxiety. This is going to be a pretty comprehensive video, so I recommend going into your library and saving this video so you can reference it later on. And don't forget to reference the chapters down below. Let's get into it. What's up guys, it's Jenna with Dog Liaison and on this channel we break down scientific research in order to inform us on how to train dogs. I'm a professional dog trainer. I work exclusively with dogs facing anxiety related disorders. This is my niche. This is what my jam is. And in my signature program, the Recovering Rover Program for Dog Anxiety, I coach guardians through treating their dogs multiple anxiety related disorders. Let's first talk about what anxiety is. Anxiety is the preparation for a significant event. Now. Whether or not that event has a good outcome or a bad outcome is yet to be determined. We'll circle back to that. But dogs who are facing anxiety are looking into the future and they're either seeing, I know where this is headed and I don't like the outcome. Like I don't want to be touched in that room. I don't want to go into that car. I don't want to go into that building. I can see where this is headed because I've done this before and I don't like that. That's making me nervous, right? Or it's the lack of predictability, which is to say that they can't look into the future. There is no reliable structure and that lack of knowing is causing them to accelerate in their heart rate. Now, from a physiological standpoint, anxiety and fear are heavily correlated, but that doesn't necessarily mean that anxiety is heavily correlated with fear, the emotion. I'm gonna circle back to that in just a second, okay? Because I, for right now, what I really want you to think about is the physiological outcome of fear. When our body recognizes that it's about to endure something stressful, something that's going to put it at risk, what's going to happen is the heart rate's going to accelerate, the eyes are going to start to dilate, and they're going to probably hyperscan, the dog is going to start checking its environment, it's going to try to problem solve. We call this the fight, flight, or freeze response. It's a very visceral experience in that the body is pumping more blood, it's sending that blood and that oxygen throughout the rest of the body, those muscles are flexing, they're preparing for action. The hard part for our dogs is that they can't always rationalize why they're doing that, right? And so what ends up happening is that even if the hazard avoidance signal is going off, because they don't have that higher order thinking, they're not able to necessarily be aware of why they feel this way. It's just sort of this experience that's happening to them. It's panic. And if you've ever had a panic attack, you know that in that moment, it's not so much of a logical experience. The perfect example is I don't like being in large crowds. I get very anxious when I'm being clumped up into a herd, you know, when you're leaving like a stadium or you're leaving a concert or something and all the people are leaving at once, that causes me a lot of stress. And I've had several panic attacks in those situations. And when you're in it, and you probably know what I'm talking about, when you're in it, it's defying logic. <laughs> like you know that reasonably you're safe, but your body thinks it's going through trauma. Your body thinks that there is a danger and that we need to prepare for it. And so if your dog is also experiencing fear of that thing, then the emotion motivating it is that much more traumatic right? So if the fear is, if the emotion and the being scared of the stimulus or the event is also contributing to that anxiety, contributing to that panic, that just makes it that much more traumatic. However, a dog can also be anxious just by means of hyper arousal. And we see this a lot in the case of like River. River is currently in the RIP. She doesn't necessarily have a fear of people or a fear of cars or a fear of fast paced movement. But her breed, which we're gonna circle back to later on, I'm gonna expand on that. Her breed makes her want to herd them. Her breed makes her want to really engage and be like aware of their movements. And for her, that's very stressful because it's engaging that fight, flight, or freeze response. It's making her hyper alert. It's making that heart rate accelerate. It's making her muscles flex. It's making her hyper scan. Her system is doing this independent of logic. And that's very stressful for her body and for her mental state as well. We don't say anxiety lightly. I think a lot of times when we're watching other dog training videos or we're doing some research on dog training, we hear anxiety used very flippantly, but really think about it as a clinical disorder. Now, the truth of the matter is, only a veterinarian can formally diagnose your dog with an anxiety disorder. Not this YouTube video, 
not me, not any other trainer, any other YouTube channel. No one else but a veterinarian can formally diagnose your dog with an anxiety disorder. That said, within with the dog trainer sphere, and when you're talking amongst other professionals that are educated, we still will talk about connotations of anxiety. And so what I mean by this is the hyper arousal, the sensory overwhelm. When we have dogs like River, who I was talking about before, who experience sensory overwhelm, they are taking in and consuming so much information. They're sniffing, they're watching, they're consuming, consuming, consuming through their, all of their senses. And unfortunately, their brains are not filtering out the unnecessary information. And so imagine for a moment, if you were taken into a wild park and your brain was not dismissing automatically unnecessary information, but instead consuming all of the sounds, all of the sights, all of the sense, perhaps all of the touches and feelings, right? If your body is consuming all that and not getting rid of some of the misinformation or unimportant information, you're going to experience overwhelm. And this instills panic in the dogs. This is what engages that fight, flight, or freeze response. This is what engages that hazard avoidance signal. And then you start getting demonstrations of anxiety. And so at this point you might be thinking, okay, Jenna, I understand what anxiety is. What do you mean by demonstrations of anxiety? What does it actually look like? And this is also pretty tricky. And I want to expand on it because it comes in so many ranges. You can literally have one dog who demonstrates anxiety by freezing and crawling underneath the table and being very quiet. And also you could have an exact same breed, exact same age, but a different dog who demonstrates anxiety very boisterously, perhaps through aggression, through perhaps through biting, perhaps through lunging and pulling and barking and being very vocal, right? And so when we're talking about anxiety, it's not that there's like one behavior to look for. Okay. We know that we're looking for excessive emotional responses, which is to say that whatever is happening in the environment, whatever stimulus is occurring, your dog's reaction to it is disproportionate to what it calls for one end of the spectrum. And you can also be thinking about this as how easily triggered is your dog? Because if your dog gets easily triggered consistently throughout the day, five, 10, 25, 50 times a day, different things are triggering him. That's anxiety. <laughs> like that is a chronic level of stress. And so what's actually happening is the dog is constantly in a state of prepared for fear. You know, the dog is constantly triggered so much throughout the day that he never actually stops being ready for a trigger because it happens so frequently. His body is always on alert. His body is always ready for the sound. He's always ready for the bang, always ready for the scary person to show up. That would be considered a generalized anxiety. Again, I've just given you a definition, but please, please, please know that I am not diagnosing and neither can any other trainer. Only a veterinarian can diagnose a generalized anxiety disorder. But you really wanna be thinking about what is the quality of life for that animal? What is the quality of life for the dog who is constantly living in a state of stress or easily triggered throughout the day and we don't really know what his baseline is? Now, at this stage, you might be thinking, okay, Jenna, you're talking about a ton of frequent triggers. My dog doesn't necessarily experience that much stress in a day. You know, he's maybe only going over threshold once a day, if that, right? He's not experiencing experiencing that frequent significant amount of stress. The next thing I ask you is, is he only experiencing that limited amount of stress because you've implemented so much management? Is he really only experiencing that maybe 30% stress in a, in a week, right? He's only experiencing stress 30% of the time. Is he really only doing that because you're not walking him where the triggers are or you're doing avoidance or maybe your dog also has separation related problems and so you're always with him because you know that if you leave him, you're gonna get stress. Is it that you have put so many limitations and adapted your life so much to accommodate your dog and that's why he's not experiencing that frequent stress. Because if that's the case, then yes, we're having a conversation about the quality of life for your dog, but also my friend, we're having a quality of life conversation for you. <laughs> like we need to be tapping into what are the compromises that you're sacrificing here. And while I appreciate that, and while that makes you an honorable guardian, is that sustainable? And is that fair for the relationship you have with your dog? Is that fair to the lifestyle you want and deserve with your dog? And so at this point, if you're thinking, wow, yes, 
My dog is constantly preparing himself for an event to happen. My dog is constantly stressed. He's triggered very frequently or he's not triggered very frequently, but it's only because I've compromised so much and I'm sacrificing so much. If at this point you're thinking that, then my friend, you need a training plan. And that is what we're gonna get into right now. So how do you treat your dog's anxiety? Well, there's a twofold answer to this. Because on this channel, we like to go deep and really understand the why behind what we're doing. I'm going to first start off by giving you some key principles, a six step principle for you to be living by. And these rules to live by are ways to start changing your lifestyle and the way you interact with your dog. We're gonna jump over to the computer. I'm gonna show you some techniques right now to start implementing the principles that we talked about. So first, what are those six principles? So what are those six principles? The first is that we need to be minimizing the frequency of your dog's stress. Now, as we talked about earlier, if you've already been implementing a bunch of management, then you're already halfway there, okay? But if your dog is constantly facing triggers, then we really need to be minimizing the frequency of your dog's triggering. And the reason is, is because if every single day, five, 10, 25 times a day, your dog is experiencing stress, that is not going to be conducive for your dog's learning. I don't know about you, but I don't learn in very stressful situations. <laughs> I don't learn very well when my fight, flight, or freeze response is engaged. I don't learn very well when I've got a bunch of blood flowing through my amygdala making me want to like punch a bag, right? I learn best when my heart rate is steady. And we know this is true about dogs. You probably can relate. So we really want to make sure that we're putting your dog's baseline at a better homeostasis as much as we possibly can. Sometimes this means having behavioral medication intervention. Now, full disclosure, I'm not gonna segue too much into this conversation. I do have two videos right here and they will be linked in the description box as well. The deep dive on when behavioral medication, anxiety medication is applicable, what they do, how they function, and how to navigate a conversation with your veterinarian about them. But sometimes those are beneficial for our heavily anxious dogs who we need to lower their baseline. Secondly, you wanna implement a ton of management. That means that you might be skipping some walks. You might be, you know, not necessarily taking your dog out at five o'clock in the afternoon, but instead you're walking your dog at 9 p.m. or 2 p.m., right? And you're really adjusting things to make your life, and your dog's life as stress-free, stress-free, which is impossible, as possible, okay? That's number one. Number two, the second principle that you want to be implementing is focusing on enrichment. Now, again, not gonna deep dive too much on what enrichment is. I have a full video that explains in detail how we provide enrichment and gives you strategies to do that. Definitely recommend you check that out. That will also be linked in the description box. However, enrichment is everything that your dog needs. This goes beyond just food puzzles. This goes beyond just brain games. My friends, this goes into, are you tracking your dog's sleep? Are you tracking your dog's water and food consumption? Are you tracking how often your dog is going to the restroom and is that reasonable for his breed, his age, right? So. Enrichment is everything that makes a dog a dog. It really focuses on the dog's hunting needs and how they seek out food and information. Enrichment is also about problem solving and being able to be motivated to overcome an obstacle that seems like it might be risky or it might be difficult. That's part of enrichment too. So that's principle number two. Principle number three that you wanna be implementing with your dog is the predictability to a desired outcome. I'm gonna say that again. Implementing predictability to a desired outcome. Implementing predictability, implementing routines, implementing structure is only as good as the desired outcome. <laughs> Because you could be implementing all the routines in the world, my friend. You could be implementing all the structure in the world. And if your dog doesn't like what the outcome is, you're still going to be walking your way down anxiety lane, right? So we need to make sure that your dog not only sees what's coming, not only can see the train of thought and go, I'm going to do that, then I'm going to do that, then I'm going to do that, then I'm going to do that. But each step of the way, he's looking forward to it. Each step of the way, he's giving consent. He's saying, I like that. I want that. I do that. That is relieving that stress, which leads me into step four. Principle four is really about making sure that we are creating positive associations with the triggers. This goes beyond just like make the dog happy. I think when we think about giving positive associations, we think about like, just make the dog happy and like rainbows and butterflies and wags. And my friends, it goes so much more beyond that, okay? When we're creating positive associations, what we're actually doing for an anxious dog, 
What we actually care about for an anxious dog is making sure that we're not engaging the fight, flight, or freeze response. What we're actually, our top priority when we're creating that classically conditioned Pavlovian positive response to a stimulus is we're telling the dogs, we're telling their hazard avoidance signal really, no need to freak out. You know, you can keep giving all the same blood resources to your automatic, you know, systems. You don't necessarily need to recruit them for your fight, flight, or freeze. No need to panic. No need to pump more blood. No need to dilate your eyes and hyper scan. No need to have, you know, the fur up on your back of your spine flex. Like, no need for all that. You're safe. Things are good. Okay? That is principle four, is keeping that hazard avoidance, that fight, fight, or freeze signal at bay. Principle five is creating the behavioral response attributed to the trigger. This is really where people tend to get obsessive, right? They skip over the association and they go, I want my dog to sit. I want my dog to look at me. I want my dog to do a loose leash walk. I want my dog to da 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 They get obsessive over this. But as we're gonna see a little later when I pull up my videos and I walk you through some of the techniques you can implement, what behavior you have your dog do is 100% up to you. It doesn't have to be obedience. It could be, hey homie, let's go smell this tree over here. It could be, hey homie, let's just roll around on the grass and get belly rubs. <laughs> like, it doesn't have to be obedient if you don't want it to. Me personally, and again, this is an entirely stylistic thing, there's no like science behind this necessarily, but for me personally, the relationship that I like to have with my dogs isn't very obedient at all. Like, my dog knows basic skills, sit down, stay calm, but honestly, I really don't use them very much when we're out in the world, right? I really want us to have a fluid dialogue. So what behavior you implement goes way beyond just like sit down, stay eye contact, okay? Principle six, the last principle is sustainability. Sustainability, meaning what do you want your lifestyle? What do you want the next five, 10, 15 years of your life to look like with your dog? Here's the truth about dog anxiety. Anxiety is never cured. That is true for dogs, that is true for people, that is true in general. Anxiety is not cured. In fact, every single individual, every single dog can face anxiety in their life at some point. On the other hand, what our objective is, is to minimize the triggers that will induce anxiety. We are trying to minimize the frequency that your dog is facing that degree of stress, that degree of overwhelm. We are trying to desensitize things that your dog is gonna encounter regularly in his life and it would be painful if every single time he came across a car, he had a panic attack about it. So we really wanna desensitize things that don't need to be that traumatic. And so when you're thinking about the sustainability of your life, you're also thinking about, are the principles that we're implementing right now, the techniques that we're implementing right now, are they going to be just as effective five years from now if my dog starts having arthritis and we notice that he also has digestion issues and so therefore as a result of the physical condition, his anxiety has returned in some capacity. Are the principles and strategies that we are memorizing right now with our trainer, are they going to be effective down the road when inevitably my dog encounters anxiety again? That's really the sixth principle that you need to hold with you because if it's not something that you can really memorize and apply in the future, it's really just a short-term fix. And there's places for short-term fixes, don't get me wrong, but we also need long-term fixes. Now let's jump over to the computer. I'm gonna show you guys my screen. We're gonna walk through a couple techniques to get you started. Let's go. Okay, friends. So what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna walk you through a couple of strategies. I'm gonna walk you through the process, that six-step process that we just broke down in principles. I'm gonna give you actionable activities now. Now in this video, you're going to see River, who's the shelter I was talking about earlier in this video. And you're gonna see that they are actively doing a game called Look at That, which I'm going to describe in a second. We're gonna circle back to how to do Look at That. But what I mostly want you to identify is the level of arousal and intensity and scanning that River demonstrates. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to let this play out. We're not going to necessarily talk through it just yet. What I really want you to do is just study this behavior and see if you can pick up some of the more subtle indications that River is stressed. Good 
And as you can see, River ended up knocking over the camera. So what we notice is that while yes, she did end up like running and reacting towards the car, right? Luckily she was on the chair, but she did end up getting up and bolting. While we see that, we could have also seen that it was coming, right? Based off of the level, if I mute it so that you guys can watch her, based off of the level of hyperscanning right here, she's kind of loose and I'm sorry for the shaky cam, it's gonna end in a second. Um, right here, she's pretty loose, but she gets an ear flick. She starts identifying that something is coming around the corner. She gets that food and immediately intensity. And now that hyper arousal is going. And even when she goes to get the treats, she is still keeping her eyes out. She's still studying the space, right? You can see just the level of getting that treat is really feeding into that arousal too. So all of this tension is building, building, building. You can see how hard that nose is working. And it's no wonder then that she ends up reacting and lunging for the car, right? So what this actually tells you is that this is not a conducive moment to train. What this actually tells you is once your dog is at that degree of, it doesn't matter that they're not lunging and barking, but they're not really engaging with you. That means that it's no longer productive to learn. And in that case, you must implement a coping management. So let's talk about some coping management options. The first is that you can do something that's called luring and you just kind of pop the treat in the hand in their face and you just sort of lure them away. Now you may see this technique done as a training technique where we are trying to get the dog to feel better about the stimulus by shoving food in their mouth and luring them away. I don't personally recommend that. Instead, I personally recommend this as a coping mechanism because it does good at getting the dog out of the sticky situation. It does well at getting the dog out of the sticky situation, but it doesn't necessarily change the association or the behavioral responses to the trigger. So something that you can do looks like this. See, she just shoves the treat right in Pippin's face and lures him away to get him out of that sticky situation because it's not a conducive moment for learning. Pippin is still too aroused to really healthily and absorb information. We got that lunge at the end. And so instead, mom is going to implement a coping strategy. This is one option. A second option is something called the flight behavior. And in the RRP, we call it, let's get out of here. So you'll actually hear mom cue, let's get out of here. So in this case, they're on the street and they're come across the trigger. Luna is not in a healthy state or ready to learn. So they're going to implement this flight behavior. So she's about to identify the trigger. And we do a quick U-turn and away. So what I, one of the reasons why I love this video is because you'll still be able to see Luna's stress behaviors. If I freeze frame it, you'll still be able to see those ears go really far back. You'll still be able to see her kind of scrunch up. I really love this video because it really shows that Luna's still stressed, right? And it's really evident that this was not a conducive learning opportunity for her. Nevertheless, she chose the flight response instead of freezing and fighting. So a healthier option to release that tension until they're in a better state to learn. We can still see that high arousal there. She's going to sniff a couple times. That'll make her feel a little bit better. And this pace off is a little bit more relaxed. Those ears are more forward. Her tail's less curled over, just generally more relaxed than she was even 30 seconds before then. And so it's very important that you are implementing coping mechanisms for training. And it's not that you're exclusively only ever using coping mechanisms and management or exclusively using training opportunities. In fact, usually, especially in the early stages when you have your anxious dog out in public, you are doing both simultaneously. And so this is Juniper. And what you're going to see is that they start practicing the engage disengage game, also known as the look at that game. She ends up starting to get kind of overwhelmed. So they end up do, doing a let's get out of here. And that is perfectly normal and to be expected when you're training. You will notice, especially with dogs that become overwhelmed just in public, in general, or at the very least become overwhelmed in their environment, 
you'll notice that you really start off doing a little bit of training and then mostly just management. And then the goal is to increase the time of training, the effectiveness of the training as you go. So I'm going to play this out and then I will walk you through what happens afterwards. So Juniper and her home man are at the park and you'll see that there's kids over there. So she's going to engage with them. and then they flee the environment. And even after this, I think she does one last check-in and then they do another, let's get out of here. So the goal is always to stay at a far enough distance that she's not necessarily becoming way over threshold, but you're at a close enough distance that your dog can identify the trigger or identify the stimulus. Now in a moment, I'm gonna show you how we do this if your dog is just generally anxious out in the world. This is a perfect example of like, if there's a particular stimulus in the space. So you'll see that Juniper is going to identify the kids and all of the screaming and the fiasco over there. She's gonna pause, there is going to be tension. So we're noticing that this is difficult for her. This is not easy. She's going to respond to a yes, which marks that she was engaging with it. This is goes back into that association stage where I was talking about how we're really fostering the association that when the trigger is in the environment, a good consequence occurs, something that you like occurs. And so therefore we're going to feed that moment. She's gonna get her treat. She's gonna come all waltzing and back to get that treat. Again, this is early in their learning. They're not very far into it. She identifies the trigger again. She gets another, let's get out of here. Again, this was difficult. And they just flee the environment. Even if she checks back in, we're gonna flee the environment. Now, Juniper did really well there. Like she was particularly happy, um, but there definitely was indications that she was building an arousal, especially as we saw that tip of that tail really tight. We saw her really leaning forward um, at the end of that leash. And most of the time people would discount that behavior as misbehaved, but for a dog who becomes overwhelmed, this is a stress response. And so it's really important that we're not punishing it per se, we're using it as information and we're making sure that our expectations of their behavior is congruent with the level of difficulty that they're demonstrating. So this is another video of River where you will see that she is at a park. They're gonna do some scanning. She's gonna to continue to feed just for the engagement. Again, this is still early in River's recovery. She's still a little overwhelmed for where she should have been. So. I'm showing you these videos on purpose so that you can identify that, you know, we're really looking for a more fluid body language, kind of like we saw with Juniper at the end of that last video. So River's going to engage with the busy park. Lots of stimuli walking around. She's going to get a treat for that engagement. Again, there's no behavior expectation here. It's just purely association. It's purely about giving your dog information that this event results in something you like. That's all the stage is about right now. Still getting lip licks, still getting some hyper scanning. So definitely early in, right? Now, once it's time to really increase the difficulty, you'll see something like this where Brimley is going to be identifying triggers far, far, far away. And her human is merely going to ask for a sit and we'll see what happens. The trigger is all the way over there. Now, believe it or not, Brimley is still in recovery from her anxiety, um, but at this stage, she had been in recovery for about six months at this point. 
And so they had played that engage, disengage, U-turn game with mom several, several times. So when she sees that trigger, she's waiting for information from her mom. And what this really tells you when you get to the stage where your dog is anticipating that you're going to be there, that you're going to give information, there she immediately like flattens that tail there, right? She turns back. She's anticipating that mom has direction. And this is your opportunity to merely suggest a behavior. Now, operative word being suggest, because if your dog is not able to perform the behavior, then in fact, putting them in that position where they feel obligated to demonstrate it could actually backfire on you down the road, wherein they no longer demonstrate that behavior. So it's really important that it's merely like a suggestion. See how they respond. And if they're comfortable doing it and they know that that behavior has positive reinforcement history, they'll demonstrate it and, and you can move forward. Right. And Brimley even says like, let's play this again. I can keep walking. Okay. So this is another video of Juniper. And in this case, they're actually working in the backyard and they're focusing on noise sensitivity. And so they're just practicing calm, relaxed state in the backyard. I know that this seems super elementary, but for a dog who is facing anxiety, especially easily triggered, being calm in the backyard where there are birds and neighbor dogs and stimuli is a tall freaking order. And so at this point, they had been teaching Juniper the relaxation protocol for a little while. This wasn't necessarily the first time that she's practiced this, this uh, relaxation protocol. However, they're also increasing the difficulty by putting it outside where there's triggers. So what they've done is they've actually transitioned out of that engage disengage loop and started to transition into behavior. This is actually a really important stage because I think a lot of times people get stuck on the engage disengage loop where they just constantly have the dog look at the trigger, look at the trigger, identify the trigger, disengage the trigger, do a U-turn. Like they get stuck in that stage that we were in. It's really important that you start to transition into reinforcing behavioral responses. And in this case, the behavior they're reinforcing is calm behavior. Okay. So one of the things you'll notice in this clip, which I really love is that dad's reinforcing through be a dog. Be a dog is our unique RP protocol for relaxation. Dad is reinforcing through be a dog, but while he's doing that, an extra stimulating trigger occurs and you'll see Juniper get a little reactive, just minorly reactive. And as a result of this, dad decreases his criteria and goes right back down into engage, disengage. This is okay. When you are trans transitioning into behavior, instead of thinking of it as a cold turkey stop where you're like, we're engaged, disengaged stage, and now we're in the behavior stage. Instead, you want to think of it as a barometer that you go up and down in depending on what the criteria and what the trigger calls for. So let's play this out. I also really love this moment because you can see how natural it is. There's, they're working in silence. There's no one's barking any orders. It feels like a natural moment, a dad out with his dog, right? That is the style that I gravitate towards. The style of training that I gravitate towards personally is where it doesn't look like training. Again, we've gone down back into engage, disengage. We are keeping things simple. We're gonna treat through that trigger. And now we're gonna back, go right back into the relaxation protocol. So as an especially triggering event occurs, you absolutely can decrease your difficulty and say, instead of asking for a behavior, I'm just going to treat you through this and create that positive association and then switch back into a behavior. The key is actually making sure that you are reading your dog's body language really well. So we're going to get back into that later in this video. I'm going to talk about really understanding your individual dog's behavior, but that's one of the key components to knowing how to navigate increasing and de decreasing difficulty. 
So this is Charlie and Charlie is deaf, as you can see. He also has, has an anxiety disorder. He also has several health issues. And so on this particular day, they were actually able to take him out around other dogs, other people in a public park. This was a major, major, major moment for Charlie. I can't stress enough how anxious our, our little boy you know, is and how trigger stacked he can be. So the fact that he was able to practice that relaxation protocol and just live a really calm, healthy life with, and just observing and thinking critically. And that really kind of segues me into that next step. Once you're thinking about the behavior you want your dog to do and what behavior you have your dog do is completely up to you. It's completely what context makes sense. But as you think about what behavior you want your dog to do, you also want to look for opportunities that you can be more hands off. You really want to look for opportunities that you can So the thumb up was the marker, just so you know, because Charlie's deaf, so we can't use a verbal marker. Um, you really want to move into how can you be more hands off and give less you know, direction necessarily, and see if your dog is able to make choices for himself. And this is a perfect example of, you know, they're there for his support. They're giving him some love. They're giving him marks and feeds. They're supporting him through this, but Charlie is doing the vast majority of the assessment in this space. They really only feed, I think like two or three times in the whole minute period. And considering the significance and the criteria of this situation, that is tremendous. Now, some other behaviors that you can have your dog do are things like touch and sit and roll over. And these are all tutorials that you can find on YouTube, many of which I have on my channel. Um, I will link those in the description box below, but what behaviors you have your dog do is really dependent on what the context calls for and what you're looking for in that situation. I'm such a firm believer that obedience is not the answer for everything, but it can be handy sometimes. So one of the ways that we really implement sustainability, the strategy that I want you to take away from this is what are some ways that you can give your dog problem solving opportunities and measure the motivation to keep going even when the odds are against him? Here's what I mean. In the wild, whether we're talking about animal like dogs or penguins or humans, in the wild, it's common for the animal to fail at getting food at least minimum 50% of the time that an animal tries to get food, it fails, <laughs> right? So the dog is used to seeking out something and it not actually achieving that accomplished goal. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the seeking is not reinforcing. It doesn't necessarily mean that just because they failed, they no longer wanna hunt for food anymore, right? Even if they fail, they still should want to hunt for food. But one of the things that we notice with our anxious dogs, dogs that perhaps are lacking confidence, is that they don't necessarily have the motivation to embrace failure. If failure comes to them, they are not willing to try again. They're like, oh, that didn't work. I'm gonna just gonna shut down and I'm just gonna play this out. I'm just gonna wait to see if my human will take care of me and just do it for me. And so while this is okay to continue doing when your dog is having a panic attack or your dog is having anxiety, you can definitely keep your dog safe and you know fulfill that need. What I actually want you to look for over the period of time is when your dog encounters an obstacle, do they actually look to you for guidance or do they believe that they can start to problem solve themselves? You know, it's very common for us to think that the dogs are supposed to look at us anytime they need something or anytime, you know, they're doing the right thing for that matter. They're supposed to look at us. But ironically, dogs are actually going to be more likely to engage with the world if they're feeling more confident. They go, I, I know you're there. I can see you in my peripherals. I can smell you. I know you're there. I don't need to stare at you to know you're there, be a human, just walk behind me and I'm gonna problem solve this parkour obstacle course all by myself, right? That is what actually demonstrates confidence or one of the ways that we can demonstrate a confidence. So if you give your dog an obstacle and they are trying to troubleshoot, are they willing to stick it out and keep going or do they freeze up and go, I don't want this? That's something that you wanna track over the lifetime of the dog. Now, as I said, as a stylistic choice, I really prefer that the dogs feel like they can be themselves. I don't rely on obedience too much. I know that's not everybody. Like, I get it. If I'm not the trainer for you, I get it, okay? But for me, I would much rather the dog just kind of like loosely walk by me than feel like he has to keep staring at me and do a bunch of skill sets for me. I really don't care if a dog has a perfect heel. If 
that is not authentic information for me. And what I mean by that is, as you're working through your dog's anxiety, inevitably you will need to master your own dog's body language. I don't just mean master your body language. I don't just mean master dog in general body language. I mean become very fluent in your individual dog's behavior. There are common stress signals, things like a play stretch, things like a yawn, things like a sneeze, or blinking really fast, right? Scratching the ear. There are common dog stress behaviors. And for a full list, I really recommend you watch this video. It'll be linked in the description box below as well, but it's going to give you an expansion on all of the common stress signals that go beyond just like he bit me or he barked at me. Like, I think we can agree that a bite is probably not a good thing, right? So we really wanna get more specific with it, but, Something that I think gets missed is that just like people, dogs have their own mannerisms. And so while there can be a common collection, just like in human behavior, we all have a common collection of mannerisms, we all sort of use those mannerisms in our own way. We're going to individual, like even how I talk with my hands, right? Like I talk with my hands, I make facial expressions. That is unique to my mannerisms and they, and you get it because you're human and you can read it easier, right? But with dogs, they have their own mannerisms as well. And it's harder for us to read those on the minute scale because they're a different species. So really embrace that you must study your dog's behavior. I mean study, I mean having the data, having the log, keeping measures, keeping track of your dog's behavioral responses, getting great at observing your dog. And if you've watched this far, I understand that you really like the science. You really like to get deep into it. Otherwise you wouldn't still be watching. So embrace that you will need to do that when you're treating your dog's anxiety. Embrace that you're not gonna be able to take the short end and just say, oh, he yawned, so therefore he's stressed, and then stop. We really wanna get, what does the yawn mean for your dog in this particular context at this particular time? That is the level of specificity that you wanna to bring to reading your dog's behavior. Something to recognize is that you are not going to have your dog trainer, whoever you hire, you're not gonna have my YouTube channel, you're not gonna have all of these resources at your disposable forever as long as you live with your dog. Your dog and your relationship with your dog will far outlast the relationship you have with any trainer. And what that means is you must be the one creating your dog's training plans. You must be the one who understands how to train your dog because you are going to be living with an anxious dog for the next 15 years. And so if you'd like to learn how to create a training plan, that is going to be my very next video. So if you're watching this in the future, it's linked in the description box. Otherwise, hit that subscribe button, hit the notification bell so you get notified when I drop that new video. If you enjoyed this video, please, please, please do me a huge favor and smash that like button. It helps me in the algorithm and I'll see you guys next time.